Oh, no, I'm not trying to be rude. It's just uh, that about, uh, about three or four days ago, I bit down on something and it cracked the root in one of my teeth back here. And uh, for the last three days, I have been uh, almost unable to move. I got a dentist appointment on Monday, but uh, it's like from right here all the way down to underneath here, it just hurts. So it's like a splinter chip in your nose? Yeah. And I just, uh, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to talk. I, the truth is, I was afraid that because if my teeth hit, it just sends me into oh. agonizing pain. <clears throat> so, uh, but I knew we had a lot of people that were going to be on Skype, which we certainly do. And, you know, we're starting a new session in junk, and we've missed so many of other things. So I said, and by the way, I, and so I didn't eat tonight because if I eat anything, that's that's an answer to y'all inviting me to have something, drink or eat anything. It's horrible what what ends up happening. So I skipped mm -hmm. dinner tonight, and I haven't even taken any pills because any anything I put in my mouth, liquid or whatever, just sends it over the top. So I'm just like, I'm just going to hold this. Steady as she goes, and we'll get through it until. Uh, but I'm doing way better than I thought I would. Honestly, I was afraid at a certain juncture I would just fall down on my knees, and tears running down my face. But the Lord's good, and you know the Lord does that. A lot of times, when we hold back because we go, well, you know, the Lord will understand. But He'll, a lot of times, He'll use us when we're, you know, when we're unable, when we don't have any strength and we, we look to him, he comes through. And he's done that for me a bunch of times. All right, we're really, um, uh, I guess we could turn to Luke chapter 18. And I'll give you just a few examples of some of the things we've been talking about. <coughs> Luke 18, and <clears throat> I start at verse 9. And he spoke this parable unto certain who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Um, you know what? I am. Um, let me just check here. <clears throat> and despised and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am, not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even this tax collector. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And, and the tax collector, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that, is, that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. All right. So let me read my little notes here. Certainly for those of us who know and have embraced the gospel, we can look back on some of the words spoken by Jesus and read the gospel into them. But it is much more difficult to get their meaning without already knowing certain truths, meaning getting the meaning out of what's being said. For example, the verses we just read give us the picture of a tax collector, a publican, and a Pharisee praying before God. In those passages, it uses the term justified, one of the few places, justified, and if, um, in relation to the publican, but may be the only place it is used in the Gospels, and there is no explanation as to how the sinner became justified, for there is no mention of Jesus' death. Does that make sense? And yet, when we read that, we automatically read all of the gospel truths that go with justification. But Jesus didn't do that. 
again, here's your big opportunity. Or Matthew or Mark didn't, or Luke, you know. None of those guys used that as an opportunity to evangelize. And in fact, I won't deal with it now, but in fact, the real meaning of it is there just like what it says. <clears throat> um, in other words, this was a perfect opportunity for the writer of Luke's gospel to present the gospel based upon Jesus' scant allusion to justification because it was a scant allusion by Jesus of justification. <clears throat> but, he pass but Luke passes on the opportunity for further explanation. Now that just... If, you're, if your mind flows in the vein that most people do in there, that's just a mind-blowing thing. Okay, um, I don't guess you need to turn there, but uh, John 3.16 is where I'm going to read from. <clears throat> Another example found in one of the better-known verses in the Gospels is John 3.16. <clears throat> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It informs us that God gave his Son, but does not mention that he was given as a sacrifice for sin, only, but only that we won't perish as a result of him giving him to us. Now, isn't that, does anyone find that amazing? That there, that, that the Gospels, almost seemed to intentionally be leaving out the gospel as far as a real presentation of it. You following me? You don't have to agree with me, but are you following me? I just want to make sure we're all walking down the same road, even if when we get to the end, we all get in a big fight. Just kidding. Because <clears throat> uh, there's only two hits in that fight. I hit you and you hit the ground. So, Sorry, sorry, little old cliff seeping through. Okay. Um, to a Jew having no prior knowledge of the gospel message, this verse might well be interpreted as a demonstration of God's mercy. John 3, 16. That God gave his son and somehow I'm not going to perish now. And in fact, would probably be read that way by a Jewish person. For without an explanation of the kind of death that Jesus died, it would be almost impossible to read this verse as an atonement for sins through Christ as the acceptable sacrifice. In other words, either these, um, either these, and many other verses in the Gospels are a very good attempt at sharing the, a very poor attempt at sharing the gospel message. Or the other alternative is that there was another emphasis which they were seeking to convey. However, there are a few passages that seem to come very close to presenting the gospel to the reader. So let's, let's look at Matthew chapter 20. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 20. Oh, please be the right scripture, because I'm, okay, yeah. You know how that works, don't you? Sometimes you're sure you got it, and you go, what? Yeah, Who's? Yeah. Go, why did I use that scripture? What? Who's Bob? <laughs> um, uh, verse 28, Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Okay, wow. Pretty good, huh? Okay, so we see here that Matthew blatantly presents Jesus as a ransom for us. This very clearly sets forth the concept of substitution, one of the few places that really sets that forth. But, if the goal of the writers of the Gospels was to present the Gospel, then why are there so few references such as this? That's my first thought. Why are there so few references? My second thought is, not only that, but if sharing the Gospel is the purpose, 
then why did Luke's account of the very same incident and words leave out this most important point of ransom when he described the same situation? And if you want to look it up, it's Luke 22, 27. Why, why would another gospel writer totally, it'll mention part of it, but he leaves out and be a ransom for many. That's just crazy. If the goal is to present the atonement. It must be remembered that the Gospels were letters written at different times, right? All these weren't written on the same day. They didn't, four guys get together and go, ready, go, you know. They were written at different times by, diff by different authors to different people groups. If the purpose is for them to communicate the Gospel, then those who read Luke's account did not get the Gospel message. Okay, are you following that? That, that Luke somehow, if he, this was, this was the, one of the few scriptures that I could think of that came close to presenting things, and it didn't, still didn't spell it out. It just said to be a, a ransom for many. It still didn't spell it out. But then Luke, who's writing the same area and the same line of thought, leaves that little point out. I would think you'd leave a lot of other stuff out, but not leave that out, unless there's another purpose for all of this. <clears throat> if the purpose is for them to communicate the gospel, then those who read Luke's account did not get the gospel message. Remember, this, this one went to a certain people group. Those people didn't get it. All right, so talking about what I'm doing now, why would anyone want to prove that the gospel is not in the gospels? <laughs> I mean, what kind of person, what kind of evil being would do that? <clears throat> so I wrote, that's a fair question. <laughs> <clears throat> Our purpose in the, in the approach that we're taking is not to prove that Paul preached one thing as the gospel, but Jesus, along with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, preached something else. There is no division between these two, amen? There's no, you, clearly, there's no division. My desire in proving that their main emphasis was not that of setting forth the gospel is done so that we may discover exactly what it is that they are trying to emphasize. And you can see, and we, we're not done yet, but you can, because I've got another angle I'm fixing to take, but you can see that if it's like a cup, okay, and this cup is basically full, and and you want to put some more in it, you can't put more or something new, something different in it until that's been emptied out. And a lot of times our concepts, even though they're not hurtful or harmful, that the gospel is the purpose, the, the gospel's purpose is to present the gospel, a lot of times we're still full of an idea that may not be from the Lord. And worse than that, much worse than that is, we're not full of the idea of what God really has in mind with us. So we're just making up stuff. You, you see what I'm saying? I mean, you, it's not critical or anything, but we're just, it's just made up stuff. It is not the real truth of that. And how are we going to get to the fullness of him who is the truth if all of our truths along the way tend to, you know, be iffy? <clears throat> okay, so... Um, in order to do this properly, I must now take another approach in our study, which will make it appear that the ma vast majority of the material in the Gospels is useless material and a waste of time unless seen in light of their true purpose. Did everybody get that? We're, we're going to take an approach that based on what has been presented and what will be presented, that if the gospel, well, well, we'll see that here. I won't explain too far. Maybe I'd best read it again just so I don't get off. In order to properly do this, I want to take another approach in our study, which will make it appear that the vast majority of the material in the gospels is useless. If, that, if, if the approach that many understand the gospels to be doing is true, and we're missing, then much of the Gospels is pretty much useless. Now, I don't agree with that, but 
but that's that's the only conclusion you can come to. <clears throat> All right. Subtopic now is birth and death emphasized. Birth and death, or or you could put it another way: death, burial, and resurrection. I'm so thankful that the Lord is helping me get through this. <laughs> oh man, thank you, Lord. Um, <clears throat> all right. So here we go. We're going to approach the gospel again in light of this truth. In the usual version of what we preach as the gospel, the emphasis tends to be upon two main areas found in the gospels. The first involves Jesus' birth, which is centered upon doctrines pertaining to the understanding of God coming in man and also includes the necessity of the virgin birth and many other truths that go with the incarnation. Okay, birth. And doctrines upon doctrines necessary to the gospel. Not necessarily the gospel, but necessary to believe the gospel. The birth. Okay? The second main area is the Lord's death on the cross, which focuses upon doctrines concerning the atonement and other things accomplished by his death. All right, so there you have the main two areas where all of our doctrines, if we could just put birth and death, and then we just started putting down all the doctrines that we believe pertaining to the atonement and to, pertaining to salvation, we would find that they would just start filling in under those two categories. Which means this little bit at the first of the Gospels where he's born and this little bit at the end is all that's important and everything in between really has nothing to do with the Gospel. And therefore, if it's about presenting the Gospel, it's all useless material. You following me? Still glad I came even though I was hurting? <laughs> it's like, you should have stayed at home, buddy. I don't need to hear this stuff. <clears throat> All right, so um, Philippians 2, uh, 6 through 8 seems to point out that the most important part of Jesus' life was his birth and death, and I'll just read it for you. This is Philippians 2, 6 through 8, and you're used to it. You've heard it. <laughs> Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. There's the incarnation. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What are the two things it's talking about? Basically, it's birth and death. It's basically saying that's all that's important. Okay? <clears throat> if this is so, then why enumerate all the other stories found in the accounts of Jesus' life described in the Gospels? If it is true that the main doctrines concerning salvation are wrapped up in these two events, then, uh, then the greater bulk of the Gospels would be completely unnecessary. For example, Matthew then would only involve chapters 1 through 3 from Jesus' birth and chapters 27 through 28 for his death. <laughs> I mean, that's taking a huge slice out of it. Also in Matthew 121, it says, and, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Birth, you shall call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins down here at the death. So you've got this huge area of meaning that maybe we're not getting the meaning of. <clears throat> Again, this reference to the gospel in the gospels is a reference that took place in his incarnation and refers to the event of the cross. It gives no credence to Jesus' life as described in the gospels. Therefore, if the great point of the Bible is to communicate what is commonly referred to as the gospel, then why waste so much time and space on other areas? Still following me? As recorded in the Gospels, Jesus is like... One reason why I'm doing so much reading is, number one, 
I, I think that this beginning part, <clears throat> if you just read it, common sense will tell you there's a, there's a real line that's being followed here. Okay. This first part has to be established before we'll ever really see what the main purpose of all of that bulk and of material is. And not just in, not just, there was not just one gospel writer, there was four. Particularly Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who continually repeat certain things. Why well, have three of them saying the same stuff of useless material? As recorded in the Gospels, Jesus' life history was silent from age 12 to age 30, right? So, I mean, look how much of material there is in the Gospels, and we skipped like, you know, 30 years, except for a few little fine points. If the rest of, if the rest of his life in the Gospels is not that important, then why not just extend the silence for three more years until the cross happens? Well... <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to think through this. I'm trying to go, okay. And I'll show, I'm going to give you more examples of the death, bell, and resurrection seemingly, you know, basically being the important thing. And all these proofs coming together to make us think and, 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 and to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit to find something that we can't find on the surface, that we'll never see, that we'll never grasp if something doesn't stir us out of complacency of the regular teaching that we always get, whether by me or anybody else, and, and, and challenge us in the word enough to say something like, the vast majority of the materials in the Gospels is absolutely useless unless there's another meaning other than the one we've all received and fed upon and said that's its purpose and never, never, never even thought to challenge it. And I say, you know, I say his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. And that any thought that I have that originates with me is probably not pure. And that I need the Holy Spirit. And I need the Holy Spirit to communicate truth as it is in Jesus and not just truths as they are in doctrines. Um, <clears throat> couldn't, couldn't he have just been born and then how he lived be hidden from public view until he decided to go to the cross instead of writing all this stuff in the Gospels? Or why not just come down to the earth strictly for the crucifixion? Why take that much room in the New Testament scriptures for things that would, for the most part, never be mentioned again in the epistles? Outside of Jesus' birth and death, there is no mention of the events of the Gospels in the epistles except one, the transfiguration mentioned by Peter, 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18. Well, that's mind-blowing. If, you know, you don't mention all that stuff, you know, you're not pointing to it. You know, there is some, a few spatterings of mentions of Jesus do, or, or of healings and stuff, but they never go to the Gospels and say, yeah, remember the time? That's exactly what we would do. If we were to write the epistles, we'd say, well, you know, what Jesus did was this, and he did this thing over there, and, you know, I, you know, I remember or I was told that da-da-da-da, and I would be really centering on all that stuff. And they never mention it once. They mention the invisibles of what happened at the cross. But then is all of that stuff not important again? And if it is, then we have to find those, those things that make it important. <clears throat> Why take that much room in the New Testament for things that would, for the most part, never be mentioned? Outside? Well, I already read those. So the early fathers put the emphasis on the incarnation. He came as a man, right? right. And on his death, burial, and resurrection. 
as mentioned earlier, Paul identifies this area as the gospel. Moreover, brethren, we're just rereading re 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you also received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. In these verses, the apostle confines the gospel totally to that history of the life of Christ in the area of his death of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That would mean that all the other events of Jesus' life delineated in the Gospels is not foundational to understanding the Gospel. This makes it appear as if the Christian doctrine of atonement does not require the things that Jesus accomplished in his ministry. So if that be the case, why in the Gospels is there so much wasted space and activity that has no bearing on what would be considered the gospel. One, conclu one conclusion is that, is that question might be that there is no wasted space because the purpose for the majority of the gospels is not to present the gospel of atonement as such, but has another goal in mind. All right, one more example <clears throat> of this to help you see how incredibly focused the gospel writers were and the early fathers on two areas of Jesus' life and pretty much skipped over the rest. <clears throat> Another example, uh, placing lack of importance on all the other areas of the history of Jesus' life is found in the Apostles' Creed. Anybody know the Apostles' Creed by heart? Yes, I still do. Thank God for being raised in the Methodist Church. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> All right. So listen, listen to what it, what it is, and then I'll explain. Some of you probably don't know what it is, but I'll read it to you, and then I'll explain it. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born, here we go, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. We went from the birth. We skipped quite a bit there, didn't we? Isn't that amazing? And this is, this is huge right here, this document. Uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence ye shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, and it's not saying the word Catholic means we're all one. Universal, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the uh, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right. So just a couple of paragraphs on what precipitated the formation of the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed was formulated by the early Christian fathers in an attempt to better define what Christians should believe. Right? Absolutely. It was meant to bring believers together based upon identifying the essential elements of the gospel by setting forth a basic common belief system. So what are the areas emphasized by this creed? It speaks only of Jesus' birth and the events surrounding his death, burial, and resurrection. In one sense, you could say that the Apostles' Creed is anti-gospel. That, that's a randyism. For it fails to mention the existence of huge portions of them. If what we know is the gospel is confined to Jesus' birth and, de and death, then why did Jesus live on earth and do all those things mentioned in the gospel. Why document the life of Christ in the gospels when the important thing is found in the work of the cross as set forth by Paul in the epistles? Are the gospels just wasted space in the Bible or is there something God wants us to see in them? How much time we got? <clears throat> okay, we got, we are, we are getting very close to ending this laborious part, but it's, it's so important. To have been said 
Okay. Um, now I'm going to get into a strange area for some of you who've been around me for a long time and around this message. <clears throat> um, I am I'll just say it like this. This isn't really the right way, but I'm going to question Paul's doctrines. Okay, but that's not really the goal. <clears throat> Is Pauline doctrine the one voice? And when we say Pauline, that's a, a theological term for all of the writings and teachings of Paul. The first time I heard it, I just went, he's a sissy, you know. <laughs> Pauline doctrine is the doctrines of Paul. It's another way of saying it. But you need to get used to hearing that because a lot of people use it. Pauline doctrine. <clears throat> is Pauline doctrine the one voice? And for maybe even people in this room or on Skype, maybe it is the one voice. If portions of what has been said thus far is true, then in one sense the Gospels do not have their own voice in proclaiming the Gospel of Atonement, but must be added in with Pauline teaching to find their place. If having a voice that declares the Gospel of Atonement is the true purpose of the Gospel, that is, that's in parentheses. <clears throat> There are many scholars and believers alike who have concluded that Paul's explanation of the gospel is the only pure presentation of its true meaning. Check yourselves. <clears throat> With that, they also conclude that any other part of the New Testament, including the gospels, that does not directly say what Paul says can only be valuable as it supports his teaching. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? But that's, you know, we're just, we're just being open here. We're trying to find the Lord, amen? <clears throat> With, um, this would mean that even the Gospels are a supplement and helper to establish Pauline doctrine. The conclusion of this would be that if John, you know, the other guy who wrote several books, you know, five books, <clears throat> are you going, really? Yeah. Um, the conclusion of this would be that if John or all the writers of Gospels is not really emphasizing the teaching of the necessity of Christ being revealed, the old nature being put to death on Calvary, etc., then their emphasis must change in order to fit Paul's emphasis. One voice, one standard, the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> Which means that that's why a lot of people have trouble with James, the book of James. Um, we tend to see Paul's teaching as the framework on which to hang the other New Testament writer's words. Then the cl conclusion is that no one has the message but Paul, and all else are to be handmaidens to him. We have limited the requirement of being scriptural and orthodox in our teaching to that of delineating and saying things in the same manner as Paul. I hope this is challenging to some of you. So my next subtitle is called Becoming Paulists. That's, I don't think I've heard that word ever used. I think I made it up. There we go, there's a good example. <laughs> Part? Really? Okay. Becoming Paulists. Yeah, and, and I may not be saying what they're saying here, but who knows. Believers who have the view that all other writers of the New Testament must be interpreted in light of Paul's teachings have limited their spectrum of what God has to say and have become Paulists. For example, if the gospel cannot be seen in light of the doctrine of Paul, then they are ignored 
are only looked upon as peripheral material used to supplement Paul's point. They may embrace the early Christians' view of Jesus, but give less credence to Jesus himself, how he lived and what he taught in the gospel, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke. <clears throat> All right, so seeing the gospels beyond just the atonement. We could actually finish this, this little section here tonight. Hmm? Yeah. I'm just so glad my face isn't exploding. <laughs> Seeing the Gospels beyond just atonement. With what has been stated thus far, we must now see that there is a difference between Paul's view of our being crucified with Christ along with Christ living in us in contrast with what the Gospels present of Christ in actions and teachings that help define the nature of the one with whom we died but now lives in us. Anybody want to hear that one again? Yes, please. Is that really, that paragraph is one sentence. Yeah, speaking to the Apostle Paul, like the guy, can, you know, a whole chapter and it's one sentence. You're going, really? <laughs> All right, with what has been stated thus far, we must now see that there's a difference between Paul's view of our being crucified with Christ along with Christ living in us in contrast with what the Gospels present of Christ in actions and teachings that help define the nature of the one with whom we died but now lives in us. I'll explain that more as we go if, you, if it's not sinking in yet. The, there'd be a huge section where we get into, into this. Paul is adamant about the fact that Jesus' work on the cross stands as a finished work that requires nothing to be added. <clears throat> Do you agree? It is a finished work that requires nothing to be added. <clears throat> Indeed, Jesus' crucifixion is enough when it comes to the work uh, having been accomplished, but to know him who died on the cross more intimately, we must consider him in the Gospels. Now, we'll, it's probably not going to go exactly the direction you think. Probably not going to go exactly the direction. We're still just laying the groundwork. His teachings and the way he lived among the people reflect his actions at Calvary. Our tendency is to see every passage in light of Paul's explanation of the cross, but never seeing Christ crucified as first the pattern and then how the Christ in you is to be believed and lived. For Paulists, it is as if Jesus' teaching, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, that sort of thing, was not important to New Testament theology. And the living examples by Jesus of taking care of the needs of others, knowing they would eventually turn on him, like Judas or the multitudes, have no bearing on doctrine or truth. But again, if the cross is all we need, as some men put it, then the Gospels are basically non-essential and should not have been put into the Bible. And why do the Gospels give such intricate details of how he lived if it is of no importance? <clears throat> All right, I have another chart and I probably should have put it up because it's a similar chart but not the same information as the one that we saw in the first class. And I just didn't think through. I think I was thinking more of just sit down and Shut your mouth for a minute, but um, I, I'll wait before I get to that. <clears throat> now, I disagree that Paul's only emphasis on the is on the cross, but some men would become Paulist, and they have made it so. Paul presented Christ crucified in terms of the life that is in us as strongly as any. He emphasized the nature of the one who lives in us to be the crucified. Most of his <laughs> epistles ended with practical examples of how this life would manifest through us. But just as the Gospels are looking down upon, looked down upon for their lack of Pauline emphasis, even so Paul's own letters uh, 
la his own latter sections of what he has written are ignored as unimportant, meaning by Paulus. They, don't, they won't even read that stuff. They never c preach on it. They never talk about it. Yeah, <laughs> very good, very good. Thank God somebody's following what I'm saying. <laughs> First of all, do you have any clue how long it took me to write all this? Any clue? And to fight through it and to search and to look and to go, wait a minute, am I crazy? And I have to go through this a lot. Am I crazy or is this really right? <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to read that again <clears throat> because the sentence after it's important. And yes, it too is a long sentence. Most of his, Paul's epistles ended with practical examples of how this life would be manifest through us. But just as the Gospels are looked down upon for their lack of Pauline emphasis, so Paul's own latter sections are ignored as unimportant or looked down upon. Uh, anything that requires living it is rejected. All right. <clears throat> Uh, same basic layout of the, of the chart, except it's going to be Paul's emphasis. I'm just going to put Paul on this side, and over here I'm going to put the gospel's emphasis. So I'm just put gospel. All right, so what we're doing is we're contrasting Paul's emphasis with emphasis of the Gospels, even if it doesn't use the exact terms. All right. Paul's emphasis, Christ in us. We all, we all agree with that. Amen? My Lord. It's, it's the Bible. The Gospels emphasis, how Christ manifests. Okay. Next one. We are his body. Paul's emphasis, we are his body, okay? Gospel's emphasis, we are his branches. Anybody see a difference there? I mean, there, there is no difference in reality, but there is between Paulists and Gospelists. <laughs> that for sure is that one. And you know what? Laughing makes this thing hurt, so y'all stop it. Y'all quit making me laugh. No more jokes, y'all. All right. So some of the differences, the very reality of being a branch implies fruit, something coming forth. Whereas the other one, we are his body, doesn't necessarily re require anything. It's just that's who we are, and we need to identify as his body, not necessarily act like it. All right. Um, <clears throat> the next section under Paul, we are in Christ. We don't disagree with that. We don't disagree with any of these, amen? We, you don't have to be a Paulist. You can believe it, but you do not need to be restricted. There is a greater emphasis that the Gospels are trying to communicate and John's writings are trying to communicate. Okay? <clears throat> so we're in Christ, but... The Gospels, we are after his kind. That says a whole different thing than just, uh, well, we're, we're seated in Christ and da-da-da-da. It, it intimates that we are of the same substance and therefore we will produce what his kind produces. This little phrase, after his kind, is used in Genesis. He brought forth seed after its kind. He made so-and-so. He brought forth seed after its kind. Well, we're, we're also going to bring forth after his kind. All right. Uh, Paul, the revelation of Christ. Okay. Over here. Christ revealed in us as a lamb. work on it there. Paul, we died with Christ. 
And this is also in the writings of Paul, but it's an emphasis that gets skipped a lot. We have crucified the affections and lusts. You see, basically this, the gospel section, Paul's has to do with the doctrinal reality, or I really probably should put Paulist up here so that we don't think that this is wrong. Whereas if it's a Paulist, it is wrong because it doesn't take within the full counsel of God. Here, this side, Paul, Paulist, emphasizing incredible doctrinal realities that are clearly in the word of God, but missing out on the manifestation, the living of it, the huge portion where Christ lives this thing. Yes. Um, yeah, let's see. The Oh, Christ revealed. Let's see. I think it was. Oh, no, it's crucified the infections and lusts. Uh, And that scripture is uh, interesting because it comes in the area of, it's over in Galatians 5, and it's dealing with the fruit of the Spirit. And it's talking about walking in the Spirit and all this kind of stuff and the fruit of the Spirit. And then it ends with the fact that whatever fruit that was otherwise in you has been crucified. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, faith, whatever corrupt things that were of us before, it's not overwhelmed by um, uh, Jesus somehow just filling us so much that we don't do that. There is a death and there is a resurrection. That death is applied to us, the resurrection is Christ. But the, but the manifestation of union with Christ is that, that union with him as a branch and after his kind. <clears throat> All right. Um, the old man with his works is dead. That's what Paul, Paulists teach. The old man with his works is dead. But if it's going to be a living situation, then it is Christ and his works live in us, if I can put it that way. It's really his fruit. And then finally, the last one. We are raised up and seated in him. And again, the the one I'm going to give on the Gospels is Paul, because Paul was not a Paulist. Interesting, but he wasn't. He, as I said, and I read it to you, he emphasized this as much as anybody. He really did. But Apollos will not even see it, can't see it. It's like, you know, it's, it's all about this stuff. So the last one is uh, from Paul's side or Paulus' side, raised up and seated in him. On the gospel side, raised to new life. Raised to new life. Not new Uh, um, doctrines or a new spiritual stand in Christ that doesn't matter how you actually manifest down here. It's just, you know, it's just all true up there. Well, to be raised to new life, and that's always been one of the scriptures that when the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to that, I saw that the resurrection was not me. It was Christ. It were, it's in Romans 6, verse 4, I think. <clears throat> um, that we were not raised to salvation. We were not raised to, um, I mean, we are, but, but, but God's ultimate um, goal is that it be a form of life, a life form called Christ that manifests in a certain way. And that <clears throat> that's the beauty of those things when it's talking about Genesis, you know, that this, you know, he and he made creeping things and they brought forth after their kind. And he made, you know, fish or land animals or fowls or whatever after their kind. And from that you begin to see life is reproducing life ultimately. And then, you, you know, you can, you know, a cow can be sitting there looking over in a pasture and watching a thoroughbred Philly trotting around, you know, and doing all this stuff. And, you know, just going, and he's going, oh, oh my God. You know, I just want to get saved and be a, 
you know. And instead, you know, we, we try and we try and we can't become that. Well, that's Christ, and this is us. And we need new life. We need that kind of life. We need his life. And it makes us after his kind then. It, it produces after its kind. And for me, <clears throat> for me, I don't want to just know deep doctrines. I, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is meant to be manifested through us in real ways and in glorious ways and in ways that we could never produce ourselves, because it is a manifestation of Christ, because it is a reality of Christ that it is. It, and it's not just a Christ who sits on a throne and we sit in him, and somehow that one's in us, but it doesn't make any difference in our lives. Does that make sense? That that one's in us, but he, he doesn't make any difference inside of us. The, the, well, I'm sorry, yes, he does. He's made a difference inside our brain inside our, you know what I mean, that, that's the thing. He's, we have all these new doctrines and stuff. And so, you know, I'm a new man because I think differently. Yeah, but it, it doesn't say let these doctrines be in you. It let, says let this mind be in you. And then it begins to describe actions of self-giving. Amen? But, but he's not calling on us to do actions of self-giving. He's calling on us to be raised unto new life, which is Christ. It's not us. It's not us becoming self-giving. It has nothing to do with sacrificial living. It has to do with Christ living, and Christ lives sacrificially. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We ask you, now that you've set the stage, we ask you to begin to um, flood us with the reality of what the gospels stand for and what's in your heart. And Lord, also to release us if there are any boundaries of Paulist's teaching or whatever that we might see beyond that and we not try to fit everything into Paul's teaching but realize that others that have written in the word of God have angles that are so valuable and they also prevent, present Christ and they, they are trying to lead us into your fullness. So we ask your Holy Spirit, be faithful to us. Not just that we hear a class and we nod our heads and we agree, but that you take us through this course and you bring us into new pastures to feed and new realizations of Jesus that we never knew and that we can glorify him over. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks. Thank you, everybody on Skype.